Okay, so in many ways, I think non-financial use cases, the first non-financial use case for blockchains is actually public infrastructure. So, and it's, it's important that we think about in this use case what neutrality means and what decentralization means. So the, the program has changed a little bit and we're gonna talk about that. Uh, Paula, do you wanna get, get us started? Yeah. Um, our clicker is not super working, but um, okay. So as Pujo was saying, uh, we're here to talk about digital infrastructure and um, what does that mean? not only uh, in the blockchain space, uh, there are all kinds of digital infrastructure, but of course, Ethereum is often envisioned as a potential uh, digital public infrastructure that can be used ubiquitously around the world. So the idea is to do some collective deliberation together on what does that mean and what are some of the requirements for protocols and standards that are serving this function. So, um, the agenda for today is we're going to kickstart this with two short talks. First, uh, Puja is going to talk about decentralization, and then Glenn is going to talk about different um, approaches to neutrality and what are some of the conflicts between them. And after that, if <laughs> the slides work, we're going to use a tool called Polis to do a deliberation together. And this tool, I'll explain this to you in a moment, but it's a tool that uses advanced statistics and machine learning to gain some nuanced insights in a digital conversation. And so we'll take these insights, then we'll have an in-person discussion, since that's the benefit of being here at DEFCON. And we'll come back to Polis, we'll do one more iteration reflecting some of the uh, learnings, and then we'll look at the results um, together. So, in essence, this is going to be um, an exercise in deliberation about digital infrastructure. Um, so, I'll hand it over to Puja to get us started. Okay, great. Um, I like to walk around when I talk. So, as I said, I want to talk about first decentralization, oh, and it's then working up. Okay, great. And uh, and Glenn will follow up with a prompt on neutrality. So um, because not everybody has read uh, the paper, I want to kind of give first principles of how I think about decentralization. And really, the question is, how do we build bottom-up decentralized networks? And there are all kinds of like networks, right? We have energy infrastructure, we have physical networks, we have internet infrastructure, internet uh, networks, Starlink. We also have blockchains, we have social media. These are all networks. And the question is, oops, uh, how do we get bottom-up coordination of individuals who are part of communities to compose into larger pluralistic networks of coordination that can solve problems at different social scales? Um, that is how I have conceptualized the question of decentralization. I'm doing this in a decentralized way. How does this work? Okay. So what do we, before I give like a kind of first articulation of uh, of the principle, let's just pump our intuitions and think about what do we not mean by decentralization. So, you know, an autocrat controlling energy infrastructure, not decentralization. A benevolent entrepreneur controlling inter internet infrastructure, not great either. Uh, you know, a group of sort of uh, mining pools that control a lot of mining power, hash power, or stake, not great for decentralization. And, you know, corporate monopolies, not great for decentralization. And, of course, there's political centralization as well. And, you know, there's tyranny of the majority, which we're all familiar with in the civil rights movement. There's tyranny of a political elite and technocratic elite. And there's also tyranny of a cultural elite that can enforce their norms and language norms on people who don't necessarily, um, you know, agree. But I think decentralization is a, a much more subtle question because we also have very, very uh, tacit and subtle what I call accidental overcoordination because of correlated interests. And we see this in particular and, and very acutely, and Glenn was the first one who brought this to my attention in his book, Radical Markets, in traditional financial markets. 
And so, in traditional markets, a lot of people, you know, if you're a retail investor, you give your money to an asset manager like BlackRock and Fidelity. And what that asset manager will do will buy stakes across rivals in a particular industry. So, say stakes across like every airline, right? But in doing that, they have an incentive to vote as a shareholder to pressure CEOs to take anti-competitive practices, lower prices, uh, excuse me, raise prices, lower salaries, not invest in R&D, not invest in innovation. And this is like not really great for markets. And if you have a bunch of groups like Fidelity, BlackRock, you know, State Street, Vanguard, all doing this,、um, it ends up being a kind of, oops, uniform anti-competitive pressure on the entire market and on the entire industry.、Um, and you, what you get is the appearance of competition across rivals, an appearance of competition across asset managers. But really, what you get is a behavior monopolist. So. Using this to pump our intuitions,、uh, one of the principles we articulated in the DSOC paper was this principle of consensus across difference. And the idea of consensus across difference is that you rather get consensus between differently affiliated people or just very different people to surface consensus, and that would be a better signal of a plural shared good across broader groups than, say, consensus amongst a narrow group of individuals who might be sort of Intentionally colluding or accidentally overcoordinating in the way the the BlackRock and Fidelity example illustrated. Is there any questions about this principle? Go ahead. Is <laughs> <laughs> consensus between whom? Uh huh. Yeah, you don't have to agree, but if you get agreement across, the the idea is that. Agreement across very different people is more likely to signal something that's good for, you know, broader groups than rather consensus amongst people who are very similar, right? Which might be more. Sorry. So okay, I will I will move on. We can we can leave this. But you can't just make one comment. Go ahead. I actually think you're highlighting a good thing, which is that the point of pluralism is simultaneously identifying areas of cooperation across difference and identifying the areas of difference. So, like, you can't have one without the other in in the dance of decentralization and pluralism. And we're going to talk about that, like, we're going to highlight that in the exercise we're going to do later. So, I think both are like really important. Yeah, I'll say this: like a lot of a lot of discussion in、um, or a lot of memes in crypto are about coordination, cooperation, but they don't really address the question of conflict, right? And so, consensus across difference is a principle that highlights and surfaces like our differences, right? But finds those consensus amongst the most diversely affiliated.、Um, so, how did we, as a first approximation, express this principle in the paper? Well, we first introduced this primitive. Called soulbound tokens or non-transferable NFTs to represent memberships to social groups or represent affiliations, and then as a second step, we propose this mechanism of using quadratic voting or funding. How many people have heard of quadratic voting and funding? Just raise your hand. Okay, so you're familiar, right? And and the nice thing about this mechanism is it、um, you know reflects the magnitude, not just direction of individual preferences, encounters some tyranny of the majority, but as sort of the BlackRock example highlights. You know, we're individuals, we're social beings, we're in groups, we're sometimes intentionally colluding, sometimes we're accidentally overcoordinating, and you need to discount the influence of correlated social groups, or in the kind of spirit of quadratic funding and, and voting, take a square root over the social group. And this gives us a kind of digressive proportionality, which we want because otherwise coordinated groups tend to drown out,、uh, you know, less coordinated groups in voice. So to kind of summarize. To get us our bottom-up coordination, the mechanism we proposed is well. First of all, seeing individuals as nested within communities and communities being constitutive of their individuals, and capturing the intensity of individual preferences with quadratic funding and voting, but also discounting correlations and say overcoordination, accidental or intentional,、uh, with, with social correlation discounts. And with this mechanism, what we're hoping to do, and this is again just a first approximation. Is to get this kind of nice intersecting, partially nested structure of ever-growing network cooperation, 
extending across you know, digital and physical infrastructure, and importantly, a, 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 a paradigm where par power is not discrete, it's not binary, it's not rigid, but rather continuous, partial, and uh, recomposing and fluid. So this is a, a broad and very broad strokes an explanation of you know, the conception of decentralization that we've ushered forward. I'm going to hand it over to Glenn now, and he's going to talk about reconciling this with neutrality and start pumping our intuitions there and asking us important questions. Yeah, so uh, Pooja did a beautiful job but went quite quickly over this notion of digressive proportionality. And I want to sort of ease into it by just um, like pressuring some things that sound natural but are all contradictory with each other. So they sort of create a paradox that forces us to think a step later. Is there a slide for this, um, Pooja, on the neutrality stuff? Or Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what is neutrality? So like, here's a bunch of different notions of neutrality, which like lots of people and maybe the same people in many different contexts all go rah-rah for, but like actually can't be consistent with each other. So like one notion of neutrality is like, every country should be treated the same. But, but then you're like, well, what about some countries are much bigger than others? And maybe some countries are much richer than others. And oh, well, mm, I don't know. Okay, and then like resources should be treated the same. like packets of information or units of compute or units of stake should all be treated symmetrically. But wait, like some people have a lot more of that than other people and is that fair? And like maybe it's concentrated in certain countries and maybe those countries are all really coordinated and maybe that's not good and then the US and China will just dominate everyone and hmm. And then like another version is individuals. So like proof of personhood people are like really into like, you know, every person should have the same rights and you know, it's really unfair that the Electoral College gives more, like, voice to certain people and, and whatever. But then you're like, oh, but, like, you know, what if that just leads, like, the majority of white people to totally screw over black people in the U.S. or, like, you know, uh, Hindus and, um, you know, Muslims in India and, and, like, well, we also care about resources as well and we care about what countries people... So, anyways, the point is that there's a bunch of different notions of neutrality that we invoke in different contexts, often very similar contexts, and that are like pretty directly in conflict with each other. Um, and I think there's like a really profound idea that starts to point the way to like how we might try to reconcile these that comes from this statistician named Lionel Penrose. So what, what Lionel Penrose said is that um, if you have coordinated, correlated things, um, and then a bunch of uncoordinated things. The coordinated things get heard much more pro than proportional to like how loud they speak or how much votes they have or whatever. Um, and, and that comes from a very basic statistical principle, which is if they, you have uncorrelated things, they tend to cancel each other out. And so like their aggregate size only grows as the square root of the number of uncorrelated things. Whereas a single correlated thing that scales up grows linearly in its strength. And um, that might sound like a little bit abstract statistics, but like it's something that literally you can just recognize from dinner conversation. So like if you go to a crowded restaurant, um, there will be all sorts of people talking, right? And like the total volume of all the people talking will be like massively louder than the person you're trying to listen to next to you. And yet somehow you can still hear that person because they're just slightly louder than any of the individual other voices. And your brain, like the whole mechanism of noise is to like take things that are uncoordinated and a little bit softer and cancel them out and like have that one coordinated thing that's slightly louder stick out, right? And um, so Penrose originally applied this uh, as a way to think about how votes should be given to countries or, you know, provinces within a federal union based on the population of the sub unit. So he said, no, it shouldn't be neutral across people because those people are coordinated with each other by their joint membership of the country or the sub unit. And no, it shouldn't be neutral across units because units have different numbers of people in them. Instead, the right principle is digressive proportionality, which is that um, the allocation should be based on the square root of the number of people within the country. Um, 
Yeah. Is this like punishing fascism? Because more people are working together, the more they get penalized? Kind of, yeah. That sounds great. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of like that. So, so the, the point is that, um, so, so he just, and, and in fact, this principle was adopted. So the Nice Treaty, the, the Polish delegation of the European Union uh, proposed that they should literally use the square root, but people thought that was weird or whatever. And so it turns out that they put in a system where like, if you look at the correlation between the square root and the number of like votes allocated, it's like a 99% correlation to that rule, but it doesn't literally use that rule because people thought that was too nerdy. But anyway, basically that's the principle that's been used by the European Union. Um, and the, the thing is like quadratic voting is just another application of that same principle. It's an application of that principle acknowledging that one site of correlation and coordination is individuals. And an individual with a bunch of stake or a bunch of voice credits or a bunch of whatever, whatever it is that they use to express stronger intensity is like a site of that sort of coordination and you want to downweight that in this square root way because coordination can occur within that individual. But coordination can also occur within groups. And, and really what I want to suggest is that all the correlation discount stuff that Pooja's going at is just like a more general application of that principle. It's like looking for all the different sites of social coordination, whether they be within groups or individuals based on stake or people or whatever, and trying to downweight that coordination so that we ensure that voices are heard in a more fair way. Um, anyway. That's, that's the basic frame that I want to give, and then there's a lot to talk about, because we don't know how to do that yet. That's, these are all just illustrations of possible things in that direction, and uh, we're groping our way towards figuring it all out. Yes, and um, as we continue groping our way forward, uh, we'll have a deliberation together here about, um, about what it means and how should we be thinking about digital infrastructure. So. Um, we're going to do that using a tool called Polis, which is a uh, plural social technology. So I'll just uh, take a moment to explain what we mean by that. So social technologies are voting, public goods funding, identity, money. These are all tools that we use to relate to each other and coordinate um, in society. And what we're doing at Radical Exchange is we're trying to bring um, about a new paradigm for technology that has a philosophy underlying it. And that philosophy is the philosophy of plurality. So I won't uh, go too much into it, but when we're instantiating uh, pluralistic social philosophy in technology, there are two things that we want to be looking for. One is we want technologies that help recognize and sort of provide better uh, resolution into the different social dimensions that exist within a community. And then we want uh, technologies to also foster cooperation across social difference. And sometimes that means fostering or illuminating the, the points of common ground. And sometimes that means illuminating the points of divergence so that they can be worked out. Um, so police is a very simple tool, but uh, be before I give this explanation, I know that our Wi-Fi is not so great. So I'll, I'll skip ahead and ask you to point your phones to this QR code so that in a few minutes from now, you will all have it on your phone. And then I'll come back and explain it. Well, as they say in Latin America, ojalá. Ojalá. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what is Polis? Now um, come back here. Uh, we have a recommendation from Shrey. If you sign into the workshop Wi-Fi with the password build it 2020 it's much faster than the conference Wi-Fi. 22. 22. 22. Okay, uh, workshop Wi-Fi, the, the, password. Uh, DEFCON workshop, build it, all lowercase, 22. Thanks, Shrey. Um, okay, so no need to go into it right now. Uh, come back here and I'll, I'll just tell you a little bit about this tool and then we'll um, start exploring it together. So the first thing is that it starts with an open question and then um, the participants can uh, write statements in response to it. And each statement will generate a card like this, and the other participants are going to be able to agree, disagree, or pass um, each of the comments. And then what Polis does is that it takes all of that data 
and then it clusters all of the participants into different opinion bubbles. So according to um, the opinion bubbles are defined according to how similarly these people uh, voted. So you can see what are the different social dimensions and dimensions of opinions uh, within a group. And then uh, the last thing that it does is that it brings to the surface what are the points uh, of common ground that these groups that have diverging views share. So one example of how this has been used in the past uh, is in Taiwan. Uh, this is used in Taiwan at the national level, and they used it a few years ago to um, try to understand how to regulate ride-sharing companies. So in Brazil, where I'm from, this was a super polarized debate, and I'm sure in many other places. And there it was as well, and there was a strong pro-Uber camp, strong anti-Uber camp. And then what police uh, did there, what it surfaced was just good common sense. So the things that came up were that uh, taxi cabs should no longer be orange. Everyone agreed to that uh, before they had to be orange in Taiwan. Um, that this was an opportunity to review uh, passenger safety uh, regulations and uh, questions of liability insurance. So just good common sense that usually in the technologies that we use, uh, we don't have that. We have the exact opposite. We have the, the polarizing statements are the ones that come to the surface. And we, we are uh, stuck in our ability to, to come together and debate uh, productively as a society. So this, this is um, an example of a plural social technology and we're going to experiment with it together right now. Um, and this is our question, how should we think about neutrality in digital infrastructure? So the first thing that we'll do is we'll take five minutes um, to evaluate some of the comments that are already there. So you can go to the link and then um, I'll be back with you in a moment. All right, um, so we'll now move to the next step, which is, um, sorry, for the next five minutes, we'll add new statements. So here's what makes a good statement for this exercise. The first thing is that it needs to be a standalone idea, because if you have two ideas in one statement, then the other participants won't be able to evaluate uh, them. They might agree with one and disagree with others, so it's complicated. So one idea per statement. Um, these need to be short statements, up to 140 characters, clear, concise, um, and hopefully raising new perspectives. Um, so let's take another five to, to add statements in response to, to a question. Okay, so now um, let's look at our report. And then police generates a lot of data. Um, Wow, okay. So we had five groups and then it collapsed into two groups. Super interesting. Um, and pol so police generates a lot of data um, and we won't be able to have a super sort of in-depth analysis, but we'll present the structure of the report and see what are some of the high level insights that police provided to us. So uh, to the folks back there, uh, El Suporte Tecnico. Hola. Pueden poner el link, por favor. Gracias. Puede eh, hacer un refresh. Oh, wait, but I, aren't I controlling it or no? No, you're not controlling it. You're you're just seeing, so it's easy. <laughs> okay. So so let's first look at uh, some some of the. Obvious thing. So we had. So, so, so first of all, I think we should just tell people what's in this report. So yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's let's first look into the structure, and uh, and then we'll get to to some of the insights later. So the first thing that it does is um, here's some data. 118 people voted, um, and out of that group, 109 uh, were clustered into different opinion bubbles. We had 3,800 votes, evaluations of statements, 78 statements, uh, 38 votes per person. So you got to a little less than half of the statements. Uh, but there's probably many redundant statements, so it's, it shouldn't be so bad. Um, and then if you can, puede poner un poquito más abajo, por favor? Ay, pronto. So here, 
uh, policies putting each sta each sta each of these dots corresponds to a statement, and it's putting all of the statements on a spectrum from consensus statements to divisive statements. And as you can see, we have a lot more consensus than, di than divisiveness. So it's just one thing that is interesting to notice is how social media distorts that picture for us. It makes us believe that we have a lot more divisions, but really we have a lot more consensus. So, eh, ¿Puede poner el mouse en el eh, punto más extremo del lado derecho? Gracias. Okay, let's see what's the most divisive statement. Uh, neutrality means treating every country the same, even if one country is richer than the other. Uh, in the other point on the right, please. Thank you. Means treating every unique person the same. Um, on the right, please. Neutrality means treating every blockchain and protocol the same and enabling interoperability between them. So these are getting to sort of similar things. And as you can see what Polis is doing now, we have three groups very dynamically changing. So group A has 44 people, group B has 26 people, and group C has 39 people. And on group A, uh, which has 44, 65% of, of uh, the members of group A agreed with it, whereas everyone on group B disagreed with it, and the majority, the large majority of people on group C disagrees with it. So here, it's, it's an example of like, surfacing what are the areas of divisiveness and the, the importance of sort of illuminating uh, what are the points of conflict because this gives a clear opportunity to have a more informed conversation about this specific topic. Why is it that the folks on group A think that and why is it that the folks on group B and C uh, disagree? So, puede poner en los puntos más de la derecha, por favor? Let's see what, what, what we agree about. Neutrality is context dependent and these questions um, lack enough context to be useful. Okay, quite well, thank you. <laughs> um, uh, en otro, en la derecha. <laughs> Neutrality is different from fairness. Um, what else? We're, we're groping towards something, be, be patient with us. Um, we're trying. Okay, so uh, uno más. Uh, más para uh, uh, izquierda. Uh, neutrality is not about removing biases, it's about embracing them all. Um, so we can see. Hmm. What is Yeah, people didn't answer, but out of those who answered, um, about 40% of of people in, in and, and just group. to be clear, okay. when you have a very large number of people, you should expect that white section to take up almost all the space. Because the whole point is that you get a random selection of things, and it tries to pick up the underlying statistical correlations, rather than like literally having everyone go through every statement. That's the whole point of the... Could everyone hear that? Okay. Um, so now, puede bajar un poco? This was just to give a few, like a taste of like, what, what are some, what were some of the divisive and, and, uh, and consensual uh, agreements, but uh, we'll look into them and sort of analyze it more afterwards. But now let's look into what are some of the opinion bubbles. What, uh, puede bajar más un poco, por favor? Más, más? Ahí, pronto. If everyone disagrees, is that a formal consensus? Yes. Which one on the top? The one that was in the consensus. Yeah, uh, so if it, if, it, if it was everything in red, it means that everyone in that opinion group disagreed with that statement. Um, so let's see how many clusters do we have now? Uh, I, I okay, so we have that. three clusters. Let's look at um, what the, the now folks... That, now, now that's we're back to two. <laughs> Okay. Puede hacer un refresh, por favor? And you know, this is a demonstration. Of course, uh, you know, this tool has been used over days, so you can sort of work through the data much better. Um, and usually very, very clear patterns emerge. But um, um, let's, you know, we're, we'll, we'll do some, we'll 
try to take some high level insights. I have a pretty clear interpretation of the two groups. Yeah, okay. So you want to you want to no, no, share? Let's, let's, just, let's go okay. through it. The, okay. Like uh, puedes bajar para grupo A, por favor? So, so, so one really important thing to understand is, I think Polis is amazing. It's super cool. It's had huge impact on the world. It's also like absolute first, like think of it as the like Bitcoin of like this kind of percent. It's, Plural it, this social is, technology. Yeah, this, this is not at all optimized. There's like anyone who's a smart technologist in the room is going to think of like seven things that could Im be improved features, not all of which would work out. But like, it's just, it's a, it's like the most basic proof of concept of this type of idea. So. Yeah. Um, okay. So, in Group A, we have um, 59 participants. Um, let's see uh, what do they agree about. So, about half of them think that neutrality means tra treating every unique person the same, whereas on Group B, oh no, sorry, I read it wrong. 85% of people on Group A thinks that neutrality means treating every unique person the same, whereas um, 76% of people in Group B disagree with that. So that, that already sort of characterizes uh, these different groups. But maybe if we look into it more, we can start to understand why. Uh, let's see. So neutrality means treating all transactions the same, sort of similar principles. Neutrality means treating every country the same. Um, neutrality means that the rules are set to not privilege any specific participant. Uh, there's more shared agreement on that. But those three first statements already sort of indicate um, this division between groups A and B. They're, um, it's, it's very binary in the end. Yeah, so the, well, why don't we go through it and I'll, yeah. I'll give an interpretation. Uh, so let's go down to group B now uh, to look into that. So group B has 50 participants and Group B seems um, interesting. So Group B is largely clustered around disagreements. So the the reds um, and it's the disagreements to the to the three statements or statements in similar spirit. So neutrality means treating transactions the same as long as they can afford gas. That was uh, not in in the other one above, and uh, the majority of people in Group B disagree with that. Um, and let's look at the first two. Neutrality in certain cases can be evaluated at a group level and not at, at an individual level. 94% um, of, of people in group B agrees with that. Um, and they disagree that it means uh, neutrality means treating every unique person the same. So you can see a pattern there. And then different forms of neutrality make sense in different contexts. For example, some should distinguish humans and bots, others uh, should not, I guess, was the last word that is missing. 85% um, of people in group B agree with, agrees with that. So now, uh, puede subir para uh, majority, ma majority, por favor? Um, so here, actually majority is not a good word because uh, what this is showing is the plural majority. So what are the statements that groups A and B, despite their divergences, where, where is it that they can find common ground? So, um, neutrality means that uh, means the rules are set to not privilege any specific participant. 81% overall agrees with that. Uh, 93 on group A, 69 on group B. All human beings are rational. Uh, everyone agreed that this was uh, a bit of a weird statements. <laughs> Personal liberty should be protected above corporate good. Um, everyone agrees. Different forms of, of neutrality make sense in different contexts. For example, some should distinguish humans and bots. Some should others not, uh, should not. Uh, fascism is needed to achieve neutrality. Um, yeah, uh, lots of disagreements there. And neutrality is different from fairness. That's an important point. So, uh, this is what's interesting about this is that despite the divergences, these are the areas uh, of common ground out of which you can start a conversation. So, um, I'll hand it over to Glenn to share a few 
thoughts on, on the analysis uh, as he was thinking about it here. And then also if anyone has any, any comments, uh, we'll hand it back to you. Por uh, bajar uh, Grupo A y Grupo B, por favor. Just Group A. Or Group A. Para Grupo A, por favor. Puedes bajar para Grupo A, por favor, señor. Gracias. Okay. Um, so th this group has statements like neutrality, and they agree with, well, well, the other group disagrees with statements like neutrality means treating every person the same. Neutrality means treating every transaction the same. Neutrality means treating everyone in the same country the same. Or, uh, sorry, treating every country the same, et cetera. And so what I would describe as this group as is sort of like the uh, maybe feel good group or something like that. It's like th there's many different forms of neutrality, which I was trying to argue were in tension with each other. And this group seems to be composed of people who kind of like all of them. You know, they're like, I don't want them to be in tension with each other, or they all sound good to me, or something like that. Like, th that, that's sort of the, 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 the vibe I get from Group A. Um, group B, on the other hand, Puri Bahara Grupo B. Perfecto. Um, this one really likes statements like neutrality in certain cases can't be evaluated at group, can be evaluated at group level and not individual level, or um, different forms of neutrality make sense in different contexts, um, and doesn't like neutrality is, you know, treating all the gas the same, neutrality is treating all the people the same. So the way I would characterize this is group A is like, I like it all, and group B is like, it's really complicated. You know what I mean? Um, and so the, the, the main divide seems to be like group A is kind of embracing the contradictions and group B is like trying to say in the face of these contradictions, we've got to do a lot of really complicated thinking and I probably can't in a tweet length thing even express what I think the next steps of that are. Or so like that. that's my interpretation. In that spirit, um, does anyone here feels like they identify with group A and want to, wants to share? Uh, elaborate a bit on their views and share with the rest of the group or group B. Any volunteers? Okay. So are you on group A or group B? You think? I'm on the group B and uh, I like, I saw it like from a perspective from like a tolerance and I, I think like you know, group A, like the neutrality yes, was like close or embraced as a, as a tolerance by the group A, that's, that's how I feel it. <laughs> like we tolerate everything and try to neutralize. Thanks. Uh, yeah, uh, Daryl Malone. Uh, I think I would have been in group A, I guess. Um, and I, I think I would say that the the complexity of neutrality kind of comes out if you look at it as a very specific thing that applies to those that are maintaining the function of a system and not necessarily looking at the decisions of a system. Um, and I think that kind of, for me, makes, makes it a lot simpler. Hi guys, my name is Ferrucho. I think I associate myself with Group B more because in a complex system, it's really difficult to evaluate neutrality when, when some uh, agents, some people provide more value than others. Hey, I'm Phil. So uh, I agree with Glenn's notion about the many different uh, conflicting neutralities. And I think that makes any decision taken on the basis of neutrality kind of reductionist. So. I kind of vibe with the like it's complicated, uh, you know, description. I think that's kind of accurate. Hey, this is Hassan. One thing that I'm interested to understand is like how would we solve that? Like when like each all countries would be treated the same? Aren't we better off splitting United States to fifty country and and so on? You know, like each. So how would we? solve such kind of attack which is like you you will coordinate again in a different way so you will take advantage 
With B, yeah, obviously. <laughs> okay, oh, one more. Oh. Hi, um, I'm Saffron. I, um, I probably was in group B, definitely. Um, and I think maybe this means that we can't say that um, a, system, a system as a whole is or isn't neutral, but that we can evaluate some degree of neutrality along a particular axis um, and kind of look at it in a very multi-dimensional way. Okay, two more. Um, I was in group A and uh, the way I, what I thought about the groupings was kind of, um, it aligned with Vitalik's paper about uh, vetocracy and bulldozer political axis. And I feel like group A is like the veto vetocracy and group B is maybe more the, the bulldozer political axis. For those who haven't read, uh, can you just elaborate a little bit on, on that? <clears throat> From what I remember, it was the vetoocracy was more like if there's a lot of people um, who are equally weighted, they'll be able to keep back kind of a tyranny of bulldozers, but bulldozers are needed in order to get a lot of stuff done. So you kind of need both both groups to balance the system. That's what I remember. All right, one more. Does anyone feel like they have something? Victor Lee, I'm in Group B. Uh, two thoughts is that um, one is probably some other people already mentioned that um, uh, it, that the social difference. There's many that dimen dimension. You cannot achieve neutrality on all dimension at the same time. So it's, it's a constrained neutrality, maybe in one or two uh, axes or dimension that's achievable. And also that to uh, to achieve the neutrality re you in require a value judgment. Right. Um, in what what make it neutral? Uh, is just treat them all the same, or sometimes maybe require treating differently in order to be neutral? And that require value judgment. That also very difficult. That's why I'm in the group B. Okay. Question. Yes. What would be your uh, What would be your take on only group B commenting, like like the vast majority of the people that have actually. Um, yeah, I think it's an interesting question. I wonder maybe if someone from Group A um, would like to elaborate a little bit more on their views um, and share with the rest of the group. Um, well, okay, here. Yeah. If, so you, you know your group A, if you, when you look at the statements from group A that people all agreed on, if you all, if you agreed on most of those statements, then you're basically a group A person. Oh, does it? Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, for me, I was in group A and I just found myself um, maybe a little bit naively having a bias towards just wanting to agree with all the statements. I, I mean, I kind of saw some of the tension between the statements, but I also um, just feel like there's a lot of different interpretations of what neutrality is and kind of just found myself agreeing with all of them. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around the terms equity and equality. And I um, would like to know from your perspective uh, if those, uh, if any of those is actually a neutral one in any of these senses. So just one thing, to, one thing to say about equity and equality, I'm not sure, but I think that people are referring to a particular meme that defines those in a particular way, uh, not necessarily to like some abstract version of it. Um, do, do you know the meme that I'm talking about? Yeah, probably yeah. that, uh, there's like a fence and then you have like people with different heights and is that the meme that you're talking about? Can you elaborate on that one? Well, so 
So, like, for example, let's say, uh, let's go to the statement that says... How many people have seen that meme? Raise your hand. Okay, most people have seen that meme. So I, I won't, like, explain what it, what it shows. But I, I just think that's what people are literally referring to. And I don't want to elaborate on it because I don't, you know, but, you can but, do whatever you want. But I think that's what people are thinking of. But when we say neutrality means treating every unique person the same, are we taking into consideration that or not? And what, uh, and what are the things that we should be taking into consideration when we say treating the same? Well, let's uh, continue developing this conversation. The idea for now, the next step. Oh, sorry, you asked one final statement. Tranquil. I just wanted to say that I have a little bit of a, I have a little bit of a difficulty wrapping my head around the term neutrality, because like. Uh, you mentioned uh, neutrality only exists in different contexts. And when we're trying to build systems that are supposed to be neutral, then that means that there's a certain bias to gain positive impact, to get negative impact, or whatever. And the, when we're not building these systems by ourselves, we're building them together. And how can we make sure that we have as less bias as we can or we don't corrupt that bias when we're building the system? That's an, a great question. Folks, um, the idea for now, uh, I want to stick to our agenda so that we can make the best use of our time together. The idea for now, this was a prompt um, and hopefully an exercise that shows some of the different views. And uh, I have to say I'm, I'm, I'm a bit impressed because usually um, I, it felt very binary, you know, the, the results here. Um, three groups, by the way. What? It's now three groups. It's now three groups. Okay, <laughs> you want to refresh it so we take a look at what, what group C is about quickly? Um, no, es, puede eh, hacer un re, recargar la página? What is group C about? So, so A is the same as before, basically, but I'm trying to understand what group B and group C are now. Okay, uh, we'll come back with a few more comments, but the idea for now is just for you at your tables for us to take 10 minutes to discuss this. And then as you, you can share your visions and uh, some, of, some of the questions that this, this conversation on police brought up to mind, uh, to you. And then what we'll do is we'll take, uh, we'll do another iteration on police. Uh, it becomes a lot more interesting when we iterate on it because we can see both sides, we can think about it um, in a more informed way. And then the idea is to try to um, understand where are the bridges, what are the areas of common ground, what are some of, some of the statements, new statements that can be added that can help bridge these groups. So uh, let's just take 10 minutes uh, to discuss at our tables. Um, what is it, how is it that we should be thinking about neutrality and your impressions about the exercise so far? Uh, okay, so folks, come back here with me. Who's hearing me clap one time? <laughs> Who's with me clap twice? Um, okay, sorry, one second. Um, so what I'd like to do right now is to uh, have some of you, so we, we asked you to share uh, what was your reason for being in group A or group B, but is there anyone here who has very strong views on what neutrality is uh, and wants to convey that to the rest of the group? Hi guys, so our talk was primarily focused on debating neutrality within democracy. Uh, he is from Colombia, I'm from Mexico, he's from the US, Canada, and what we all talked about was that it's really complicated to have to weight each vote the same when some of that democracy is corrupted from the, from the, campaign, uh, from the campaign start. For example, in Mexico, right now we have uh, AMLO as a president and he's building a lot of infrastructure projects that don't make sense and more than 60% of the population agree with him but it's really difficult for people who well it's it's really difficult for the right incentives to guide the correct policies because when somebody can quickly say okay I'm gonna give you uh, this short-term reward for your vote 
Well, that's difficult. So what we were basically talking about was neutrality in different contexts uh, basically makes it yeah, it's, it's very difficult to have a neutrality when the people acting on it have different incentives. Yeah. So I'm from Colombia and here in Colombia, a big social problematic is buying votes. So people, although we debated about how it ended up affecting the policies and the actual morality of it, at the end of the day, it's not the right incentive. It's an incentive external to the, to the one that should be, which is the actual policies and beliefs of the governor. So weighing those people who are kind of neutral and don't know who to vote for or don't, are not really interested in voting for, and you offer them an incentive, uh, economic incentive, then it becomes like their vote is not for the people, it's for them. And their vote is not actually for what you're voting for, which is the governor, but for the th whatever money they gave you. So should that vote be taken into account? Because according to a neutral perspective, it should. But I at least doubt it should. Thanks. Um. So I think at our table, we all agreed that it's not an easy thing to define, especially coming from like foreign languages. We had like a, an English as a second language was like, we had a hard time even like reading those statements and comprehending them and processing. Uh, but one thing that we all agreed that natura naturality is uh, pretty much a, a status of here and now. Uh, even with like what you just said about political vote, like here and now you're natural, but maybe within like a few weeks you will have an opinion and you will be agreeing or disagreeing. So it's a, almost like a you cannot keep the state forever. It's just a here and now how you feel. And it's yes, exactly. So we kind of had the same um, feelings about like this exercise and like how we think about it. And it changes for sure. It's not something we can have forever. <laughs> this is super interesting, sort of speaking to the needs for sort of continuous adaptation, adaptability. Um, okay, so now I'm curious if, uh, was, was there any of you who were either on group A or group B and after this conversation sort of gained a new understanding of the other group's perspective that you didn't have before? Um, and maybe change your mind a little bit or just had a bit more nuance in your views and would like to share that with the rest of the group? Yeah, I, I, that really stood out to me. I'm Alex, by the way. Um, that as I was sort of watching these questions and how people were describing neutrality and siding with it, I feel like neutrality for one uh, took a lens where neutrality was very close to goodness, like as if some people were already feeling like neutrality was good and that's how they were voting. And another perspective which started clearly like forming for me as we were doing this was that some people, at least to how I see it now, seem to take neutrality as a rule we apply regardless of context, which if you're going to strictly logically define things, like I think that makes a, a lot of sense. Um, but yeah, not everybody's going to view it that way. And then if you get into complexity and no, it's context dependent, then you get a very clear uh, split. So it's really interesting to see multiple shifts in what I understood to be neutrality happen as we were going through how other people uh, observed it. Uh, yeah, so kind of referring to what I was saying before, I mean, like one observation, like hearing here and like here discussion at the table was that um, yeah, very often, like we want to tolerate someone else's opinion. We want to be like uh, good in a society, but uh, me, me being part of the group B, yes, kind of like, you know, opposing to say that, okay, we can't neutralize things. We can't tolerate everything. Yes, like uh, bad things should be called out, right? Like uh, neutralizing the value, meaning like, you no, know, getting rid of, our civilization kind of the thing, right? So yes, it's complex, <laughs> but you know, um, the, the problem is that, uh, like at some, uh, extremes, like a neutral thing can be in my opinion, bullshit. 
right? If we like really know, like take the value out of it, right? Um, yeah, but I think like that's the problem. <laughs> Anyone else has some uh, bridging reflections? Okay. Thanks. I'm Leonardo, and I was thinking about because we are all talking about neutrality, like just neutrality, but at the question it says about digital neutrality, right? So I was thinking about if it is um, like maybe a difference or something very specific to digital. Because thinking about digital, I thought that um, digital, it maybe refers in, in general to um, binary data info, right? And it is, it is built like that mainly for communicating. So maybe if we talk about digital neutrality, we are talking about communication across networks. So from that point, I see that maybe it's not like that complex, the, the term of neutrality, because if you talk about communicating over networks, it could be like any peer has the same chance to communicate with other, other peer, right? So um, at that point, I think that I was in the group A because I didn't see like a bigger complex problem, but something in a, in a specific context. Then if we talk about neutrality as general, uh, everything neutrality, I think that we get to that point where it can be many different things and have many different ways to express neutrality, right? Yeah, and to emphasize that our, our question is directed towards digital neutrality. So that's um, digital public infrastructure, um, neutrality in, in digital infrastructure. Um, does anyone has any other uh, sort of insights or bridging comments that they want to share? Okay. Um, I thought that was a very insightful um, exercise and um, I think I was more associating myself with the group A at the start and then they were discussing and I was hearing other people giving feedback and I think, I mean, as just a human being, uh, it's very hard to make binary choices like uh, just 100% yes or 100% no. And um, for me, it was like, I would agree with the, like most of the maybe uh, questions that the group A was agreeing, but unless there's some exceptional circumstances kind of the situation. So for me, it was, um, I was more, um, you know, uh, it was closer to me to vote on A group because uh, like maybe 80%, I would agree that as a basic rule and basic understanding of neutrality, but then also leaving room for, you know, I don't know, exception in special cases rather than just saying completely no and disagreeing. So, yeah. So this is actually a, a wonderful point because we'll, we'll iterate on the platform one more, one more time after all of these discussions. And in this iteration, this is the opportunity for you to add that extra nuance that you felt was missing in the former statement. So neutrality is ta-ta-ta-ta-ta-ta, unless ta -ta 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 -ta. So you can, you can add that nuance and that complexity uh, in, this, in this second iteration. This is a little bit of a troll point, but it did change my views. So someone said the word neutralize earlier, and I, re I made the connection between neutrality and neutralization. Like, wouldn't the most neutral thing in the world just be if none of us really existed? That would be super fair. It'd be super conformant with all of Group A's statements, vacuously satisfy any definition of neutrality. Um, so just putting that out there as an idea. OK. So what he said, I just thought of something like, when we talk about digital neutrality, right, it obviously becomes a lot easier to enforce because you could like create things at protocol levels which humans cannot change. So obviously that is not, we don't exist, but we lock out a lot of choices that you could otherwise have in that, and then in a sense you are like, a lot of like freedom of choice is gone and thereby it's a lot more neutral. It's not like very far from what he said. I was a little bit dismissive of Group A and, and identified with Group B, but just to, like, I thought that your comment was very insightful, which is, um, I think that many of people in Group A seem to have thought of each statement as having much more implied context than, like, I was thinking, like, they were, they might have been stated in a universal way, but a lot of people thought 
well, of course, they must be talking about context X or context Y. And so I'm in agreement with the statement because I see that implied context. But if we draw that out, maybe there wouldn't be as much disagreement between the two groups because group B was really thinking of them as very broad statements and group A was thinking of them as specific to the context where that principle is appropriate. So now in the spirit of adaptability, uh, I want us to, I, I'm sorry, I can take more uh, inputs because I want us to take the time to do one more round. Uh, let's, let's see how, this, how these notions um, evolve by going back to the platform and adding bridging statements, uh, statements that have richer contacts and that add the exceptions to the rule and that you feel um, can sort of um, reflect anything that you might have learned uh, about someone else's point of view uh, today, or anything else that you might that you might want to add. You know, uh, it's not a, a tyranny, but uh, uh, I think one of the particularly interesting things is to try to add that additional context and nuance, and um, and try to bridge uh, what are some of those different views now that you've been more exposed to to them. So let's take uh, five minutes for that. OK. Um, let's come back to, to the report and see how things have evolved. So you know, this is interesting. I've, I've done this uh, workshop. I've used it, this tool a number of times. And I have to say that this was definitely the most binary <laughs> conversation and the most binary group that I've ever um, worked with and have sort of seen represented in, in this tool, which to me, what that says is that this ecosystem needs a lot more <laughs> of these kinds of tools and sort of conversations because it feels like, yeah, it's just very binary. <laughs> but uh, we've evolved. We have a solid third group right now. Uh, so I think group A, um, remains uh, with similar views, group B sort of skeptical and saying it's complex, it's complicated, but not really articulating uh, what what that complex vision is. And then uh, kudos to group C who is starting, starting to um, create some of these articulations. So let's look into uh, group C together. Uh, this was really interesting. So group C, uh, is saying neutrality must be put in a context, um, otherwise it doesn't make sense. Neutrality is not an optimal solution for the evolution of the human race. Incentives are inherently non-neutral, um, and they super disagree with uh, treating every country the same, and every, every unique person the same. So they're saying, you know, you need context, you need uh, to take into account different incentives, and um, you need new, I think that what's, I won't put my interpretation of the comment about ending the human race is that sort of affirming that uh, that you want plurality, right? You you want to have diversity. You don't want to um, collapse. So, is there any conception of neutrality that can also make room for um, pluralism? Um, remains to be seen, but I think that this statement is expressed that this is a desirable uh, thing. Um, so, yeah, this, let me do one more refresh here to see if anything uh, different came on group B. <laughs> the guy that said we must all perish to achieve neutrality made a good point. Um, and let's look at the uh, spectrum here. So, a lot more concentration here on consensus. Um, Neutrality, while important, is not the only goal. Neutrality is layered. Some layers of the system should, should strive to be neutral, um, and some layers can be biased. We should continue to ex <laughs> should continue this exercise on a bar with drinks. Um, OK, so let's, go, let, let's see um, what is it that all three groups can agree. Neutrality means the rules are set to not privilege any specific participants. Neutrality is different from fairness. Um, individuals should have autonomy over what products and services they use. And neutrality, while important, is not the only goal of a society and needs to be balanced with other priorities. 
Um, and then what are some of the things that, the, the, it's interesting because there's almost, usually in the um, plural majority section, there's more agreements than disagreements. This is pretty half and half. There's a lot of areas of co common ground of disagreements. Neutrality is fascist. Um, neutrality means indifference, not caring. A lot of people in disagree with that. Super interesting. The group is never right against the individual. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, you know this this is super rich, and there, you know, it, it merits doing a proper analysis that we can't do uh, right here. But hopefully, this was an interesting exercise. Neutrality is a huge value. Uh, in this ecosystem, and uh, it's one that has very, very serious and important implications. So, um, I'm, I'm curious to hear any thoughts, reflections, comments on this exercise or anything that you might have uh, learned, and um, and we'll be posting uh, a more uh, sort of thoughtful report um, of how this went. Uh, online, so you can look for it on the Radical Exchange Twitter, or you can come up uh, to the table and um, just send me, just give me your email. And uh, yeah, hopefully this was this was a good exercise. So I'll take a few comments and then we'll wrap up. Just a question about the tool and the exercise. I wanted to know if. Um, in the second round, did we vote again on the same statements or the votes we already had uh, issued of the statements on the first round stayed the same? Because like from a deliberative, uh, democratic perspective, it would be interesting to vote again on, on those issues, like after debating. Yeah, Polis is open source software, so it needs uh, a lot. <laughs> it needs a lot of work. Um, but no, the, the votes remain the same. The votes remain the same. So I thought that was a, an interesting experiment. I guess one question is, um, I think this group is like all coming here with good faith and good intentions. Um, and one thing I noticed is like, as people answered questions, even if I wasn't answering a question, the groups could like pretty quickly kind of shift and also my position in the groups kind of could quickly shift. So are you thinking about this in the context of like people who might want to like intentionally create those shifts or like kind of a more adversarial mindset and how would you mitigate that i guess no yesterday we were giving this workshop to a group of organizations that are working on uh citizen participation in the southern southern hemisphere and they were like my god this is like such a good tool for political manipulation and you can use it for good or bad i mean it can go in any direction but um Part, part of the thinking behind uh, trying to advance a paradigm with more pluralistic social technology is that if we if we can um, provide more resolution into the different social dimensions that exist within a community, then that's that's the only thing that will unlock good governance and uh, our ability to find to cooperate across diversity. So, uh, you know, it comes it's a double-edged. Uh, sword. I'm not sure if that answered your question. One other thing I'd say, Phil, is that um, it's just really interesting that, like, in this sort of socially conscious way of approaching things, as opposed to, like, ones that are modeled purely on marketing and digital incentives, we just have, like, no analyses whatsoever in any field of, like, incentive dynamics and impact. Like, it just doesn't exist. And, like, that's a really interesting challenge here. Like, what, what is the incentive model you even want to use to analyze this? Is it based on individual attacks? Is it based on group attacks? Is it, like, and what are the optimal? I, I don't even know. I have no idea. Like, it's a really interesting question, so. Just to share my perspective on the highlighted statement, I thought this, the other priorities are more like today versus the future. Like, if you ask me, should the world today be neutral? Yes, of course, there should be fairness. Had the world been neutral from day one of existence, would we reach here? I don't know. So, I mean, I don't have an answer, obviously, but like, I thought that's what like, that statement is all about. Like, today's neutrality versus neutrality as a tool to forward the human race. I'm 
some comments on, on, on the exercise itself. Uh, I think that the exercise heavily depends on the quality of the questions. And probably we need to have some um, approach to exclude some, some of these questions. When we see some white areas there, probably those, those questions were not very, you know, uh, so people didn't want to, to answer this question, probably we should exclude them. Or probably we, we should have another option on the, on the poll, so where people are voting, so they can kind of exclude or report against this question. Thanks. Um, we, uh, Radical Exchange, we do develop a few technologies, but this is not developed by us, it's uh, by the amazing folks at uh, the Computational Democracy Project. Um, and it's an open source software. Uh, you can make a pull request or give them some support and share your feedback. Uh, but yeah, as, as Glenn was saying, this is a very, very primitive tool, but it is better than <laughs> most of the things that we're using in trying to, you know, identify social groups and and uh, illuminate areas of common ground and disagreement. Um, and it, it's it's something to it's remarkable how how primitive it is and and the fact that it's still uh, one of the best tools that we have, so we need to continue uh, developing this. Can I jump in? Yeah. Hello? 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 Yeah, so going back to the earlier part of the, I, I, I find it interesting because I tried to prime the discussion with like a conception of decentralization. Um, and uh, so we could actually use some of those if somebody wants, if, you know, if anyone here is a hacktivist and wants to improve polis, we could actually import some of those concepts there. Like, for example, having non-transferable NFTs to represent your groups and allowing quadratic voting. And then we could have a much richer perspective of clustering there. Um, but the, se the second observation I wanted to make, like, Glenn, you gave your perspective on the clustering. But I actually, I think the difference between group A and group B was like A was sort of more biased towards thinking about neutrality um, in, the, in the sort of voice camp of voice versus exit and thinking about equality and notions of fairness and being like, yeah, yeah, of course, like individuals, nation states, right? And then I think group B was maybe more focused on like neutrality as an exit. I should be able to be able to send my information packet wherever I want to, or like, you know, transactions independent of gas, or with the exception of gas, sorry, with gas is the only limitation. So I thought that was, that's kind of, I think there's some broad strokes that can be made there on like voice versus exit and how that, that how, where, where you kind of are on that um, might inform your view of, of neutrality. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk about like, you know, um, using some learnings from, I mean, this workshop into the DAO, like uh, DAO tooling specifically, right? So like very often in DAO that, you know, uh, the questions we ask in the DAO may be not the right, it's not, may not very often the right one. Like, for example, yesterday we had a workshop with, um, with Maker on like how to optimize their governance process. And like, you know, there was some drama related to... Uh, yeah, basically some voting. Uh, currently in Cosmos, we have uh, like this huge proposal for Atom 2.0. And uh, yes, like uh, very often we cannot like, you know, uh, get an agreement because uh, the scope of, uh, of a decision is huge, right? So like applying these tools for DAOs to make more, I mean, to break them down and more make more uh, specific uh, decisions, yes, I guess that would really help in. Uh, I mean, if there are any hacktivists in the, in the room wanting to contribute to Polis, and uh, I know that there was one um, integration with Web3 wallets um, that was made last year, um, but uh, we ended up not using it. But I'm happy to connect you uh, with the folks who worked on it and as Glenn was saying, I mean, if this was, if you could quadratically vote on the statements, uh, this would be incredible. If you could also connect it with SPTs that are being used today, for example, for um, at the Govern platform that creates uh, SPTs for DAO contributions, and then you have internal uh, clusters, you have external clusters. So, you know, there's there are many ways in which this can develop. I'll go to some of the other folks. Okay. 
I mean, what do you mean of quadratic voting for like yes, no question? I mean, it's. I mean. Be able to express the intensity of how, how much you agree or disagree. But, but it can have a quadratic system with it. You can have like credit credits that um, that you can spend. Oh, um, if you have a set budget to spend, don't you have to see everything at the same time to figure out how to allocate your budget? Um, we we have a software for quadratic voting that we developed at Radical Exchange, and the way that this happens is that you usually go through it through the different proposals a couple of times, and you sort of distribute it once, and then you sort of continue readjusting it a few times, which means that you probably need some way of curating a smaller number of statements. Um, Our sort of way to hack around this is that in many workshops that we do at Radical Exchange, we first do a, a police conversation, then we do we curate a ballot, and then we put it in the quadratic voting platform, and then we do a vote. Um, so we do this deliberation, and there's also a delegation step. So you have some credits, then you delegate them around, then you then we do a police deliberation and then a quadratic vote in the end. And it, it works pretty well, like in, in groups that are actually like trying to um, work around a, a solution. Um, we've seen groups that have sort of been having a very hard time in advancing on a particular issue for months. And then they did a workshop in one and a half hours using these three tools. And uh, they sort of unlocked a few things. So it, it, it's a pretty good idea, but it would be better to have them more integrated. Did you guys also think there were some like broad strokes differences in one group thinking about the idea of neutrality versus one group thinking how would neutrality be applied in the real or the digital world? Might be. Folks, we have five more seconds in this workshop. So I just want to thank everyone. Um, and I also want to say we have amazing infinite diversity in infinite combination stickers here. So you can come grab them. And, um, and if you'd like to, to get the report of this exercise, we'll post it on the Radical Exchange Twitter. But um, I can send it to your email as well. Just come over and send me and give me your email address. Um, and thank you so much.